Yeah, so I'm I'm really happy to to introduce Clark Barrett's invited talk uh, at EGR this year. Clark obtained his PhD at Stanford in 2003. And um, after 10 years at uh, NYU, at, uh, New York, he is now back in Stanford, uh, where he leads um, what I believe is the currently largest group doing uh, SMT. So Clark, Clark's bibliography counts uh, many inspiring uh, theoretical results. Uh, and also he has been since the SVC solver right at the beginning of SMT at the core of the development of, uh, of the line of SMT solvers that now results in the very successful CVC4 uh, solver, which regularly wins many categories in the SMT comp and which is also currently used in uh, several industrial projects. Um, so I think we, yeah, it's, it's now 15 past and Clark, we are listening to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, it's really uh, an honor for me to be speaking here. I'm grateful for this opportunity. And, um, you know, I only wish uh, we could all be in Paris, but we'll do our best here. Okay. So um, I like to start uh, my talks these days with this little guessing game. So uh, follow along. Uh, I'm thinking of a research area where algorithms have recently improved by many orders of magnitude. Computers can solve tasks better than humans. Computers solve tasks without help from humans. Uh, there's big investments being made by government and industry and including major companies like Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, Intel, Microsoft. And uh, you can describe it with two letters. And the first one is A. So now you should all think of what uh, this research area is. And of course, it's AR, automated reasoning. This is my uh, automated reasoning logo. OK. So for all of these reasons and many more, I think it's a very exciting time to be working in automated reasoning. Um, and in fact, what, what I'd just like to highlight briefly uh, how the recent improvements in automated reasoning tools are quite stunning. Um, this is a slide I stole from Moshe Vardy's talk at Flock. Uh, this shows uh, dramatic improvements in uh, SAT solvers over about a 10 year period, um, you know, where where essentially the best solver in 2012 is 1,000 times faster than the best solver uh, in 2000. And we did a similar experiment with SMT solvers on bit vector benchmarks. Um, and again, what we showed is that uh, in about seven years, um, the average speed up was about 11x. But uh, this really doesn't tell the whole story because uh, in 2010, there are over 3,000 benchmarks that could not be solved. And now over 2,000 of those can be solved and not just solved, but in, in less than one second. Uh, so there's really been this tremendous um, and continues to be this tremendous uh, improvement. And, um, and so that's one of the reasons it's exciting to work in this area. Um, and in fact, this has led to what I call a sort of new research workflow for many uh, areas of computer science, where you take uh, an application you figure out how to encode it using your favorite automated reasoning tool. You hand it off to a solver, and you know suddenly you can uh, solve your problem. Uh, so this is pretty exciting, and I'll tell you more about this specific um, application area later. But uh, of course, so yes, this is exciting and great news. But of course, sometimes the workflow fails, right? So uh, somebody uh, has their has their problem. They try to encode it. And what happens when this doesn't work? Well, they get frustrated. Um, and I think people end up wasting a lot of time. They try different tools. They try all the different options. Uh, they write papers about you know, jumping through hoops to get the encodings right. Um, and so you know, it really slows them down. And I think what's also quite uh, unfortunate is they often draw these sort of premature conclusions that, well, we know that SMT doesn't work for this, or we know that SAT solvers don't work for this or something because they tried it a little bit and it didn't work. 
Okay, so I think this is a, a challenge that that we need to address. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about how we can address this. <clears throat> so the first option is, you know, just tell them to wait a few years and the tools will be better. And I think that's true. Um, so every year, more, more, uh, more applications sort of work out of the box. But I think a, a more exciting and interesting option is what can we do uh, on our side to make tools that can flexibly adapt to these new domains? So what I'm gonna talk about today is some work in this direction uh, using uh, SMT. Okay, so I'll start with just some background on SMT um, and then I'll give a couple of examples of, of research streams where we sort of uh, use this idea of uh, domain reasoning and uh, then uh, I'll conclude. Great, okay, so uh, probably most of you know what SMT is, but just in case you don't, um, the idea is you're given a logical formula and some background theory. It could be a set of axioms or a theory described in some other way. And the, your job is to determine whether there exists a model, a model of the theory that also satisfies the formula phi. And um, there are you know, a number of approaches to solving this problem. But one thing that's sort of key to understand that I'd like to highlight in this talk is that the theory T is a parameter to the general method. So in other words, you can plug in different theories and moreover, the uh, standard approaches for SMT allow T to be a union of several theories. So this means that you really have this, uh, this key flexibility where you can add new theories, new theory solvers uh, without changing the, um, the overall framework and without uh, re-implementing existing solvers that you already have. Uh, and, and this is re really sort of the thing that we'll leverage and I'll show how you leverage uh, in this work that I'm gonna describe, describe today. Um, just a bit about how this sort of all works under the hood. I won't go into too much detail, uh, but basically there's a SAT solver and the SAT solver sees only the Boolean skeleton of a formula. And so it builds a partial model, uh, assigns truth values to the, the abstraction of the first order literals. And then um, it takes that assignment that it's built and sends it into this, uh, what we call the theory core. Uh, and the theory core uh, has the job to coordinate um, among all the theories. It takes these literals coming from the SAT solver, turns them back into uh, theory literals, and then sends them to the appropriate theory. Uh, and then finally, the theory solvers, all they have to do is worry about uh, conjunctions of literals in their own theory. And so they'll get a stream of literals coming in and uh, they have to determine whether that set is satisfiable or not. And of course, to be efficient, they have to do other things like be incremental, incremental, backtrackable, and do theory propagation. Uh, all right, so this is the uh, DPLLT architecture for SMT that's quite well known. And again, uh, just to highlight, it has this nice modular property that you can um, focus on these individual theory solvers. <clears throat> okay, so let's go to some uh, examples of work in this area. So the first area I'm gonna talk about is something um, fairly new. This is an area on verifying neural networks. And uh, this is joint work with a number of people. Um, my former postdoc, Guy Kotz, uh, David Dill, Michael Kokendorfer, Kyle Julian. Uh, they've been great collaborators to work with. And uh, this uh, whole project was really motivated originally by um, by an application in airborne collision avoidance. Uh, and the idea is, uh, and specifically for drones, so the idea is you've got some drone flying and it has some data that it's, uh, that it's getting from its sensors about uh, other aircraft in the area. Uh, the data would include things like, you know, the relative velocities and angles and headings, um, distance and so on. So given these data, the goal is to produce an advisory as to whether you should take evasive action or whether you're clear of conflict. Um, and uh, my colleague, uh, Michael Kokendorfer, who's a professor in Aero Astro at Stanford, 
they approached me with this problem and said, uh, you know, we've got this, this candidate implementation uh, to solve this. And for various reasons, uh, it turned out that they wanted to use um, neural networks to solve this problem. And it turned out that the neural networks were smaller and uh, more effective in simulations. But the big question is, could you trust, uh, you know, could you trust this sort of safety critical application um, using a neural network? Okay, so this was a great problem. And I, uh, you know, we launched into seeing how we could solve it. So, uh, of course, a deep neural network, just quickly, you know, I didn't know much about them at the time. So I sort of asked, well, what is it? And it has these input and output nodes. Um, and then it has these internal nodes, the hidden layers. And the hidden layers uh, compute a weighted sum of the previous layers using linear arithmetic. And then they apply this activation function. And the activation function, uh, there are various different kinds. Um, but then it uses that to produce the output at each node. OK, and so the particular activation function that we're looking at is this rectified linear unit, which is very simple, just takes the maximum uh, of the input and 0. Uh, it's fairly common, um, but it does introduce this nonlinearity. And uh, this makes the problem of analyzing deep neural networks incomplete. And to just look at a simple example of uh, how this might work, um, let's say you have uh, a network like this. <clears throat> so there's an input x1, an output x4, and two nodes in the hidden layer. Uh, we would uh, write it this way. So x2 is going to be the result of applying the rectified linear unit to the weighted sum, which in this case is just 1 times x1. Similarly, with x3, uh, we apply the activation function to negative 1 times x1, and then x4 is the sum of those two hidden layers. This is a very simple example. And we can encode this using uh, SMT, right? So this is a, the first thing we tried. Um, uh, we tried an encoding like this. And so what you can do is each rectified linear unit can be encoded as an if-then-else uh, constraint where you take the input as the condition. And if it's uh, more than 0, you pass it through. Uh, otherwise, you do 0. OK, so this is very straightforward. <clears throat> uh, but the problem is that uh, this naive encoding in SMT didn't work at all. And for the networks that uh, you know my colleague had trained, uh, they're pretty small as deep neural networks go. There's only about 300 uh, hidden, hidden nodes. Um, but the SMT solver really was not able to do anything very smart uh, with this 2 to the 300 search space. And so it ended up just getting lost. And we tried another encoding using mixed integer linear programming. Um, there's a sort of standard encoding to do uh, this Boolean disjunction that you need in the if then else. And this also did not work. OK, so that's great news. We have an exciting research problem. So this is where I'd like to highlight this, uh, the theme of the talk, um, because what we really needed to do here now was find a way to adapt our solver to this domain. And uh, you know, SMT solvers include this theory of linear arithmetic. We have a theory solver for that. But in this initial encoding, the rectified linear unit had to be modeled outside the theory using this if-then-else construct. And that was really the problem. We didn't have a way to, to natively reason about this uh, in the theory solver. So uh, SMT gives us this flexibility. What if you extend the theory to include this new operator? Um, and there's no problem. We can extend the theory, add that as a, a element in the signature. And then we just have to adopt the theory solver. So SMT solvers implement uh, an incremental simplex solver. And so the question is, can you extend this algorithm so that it understands this new operator and somehow uh, is able to reason about it more efficiently than this, this other encoding? So that was a challenge. And uh, just as a side note, you know, I, I think it's really useful to ask these kinds of questions. And I think it's uh, not done enough, right? So typically, solvers are treated as black boxes. 
Um, but if you're willing to open up the black box and look inside, uh, there's a lot more you can do. And I think a big challenge for uh, our community is how do you make uh, it less formidable to sort of open up these black boxes? I'll come back to that later. Okay, so let's take a look at the simplex calculus inside the SMT solver and see how we can uh, adapt it to reason about these ReLU constraints. So uh, the, I'm going to give a quick overview of, of simplex. So the idea is you have some variables that are uh, real arithmetic variables, x. And then a simplex configuration is going to be a five tuple, where you have a subset of x that we call the basic variables. Uh, you have a tableau. The tableau is a set of equations. Uh, each equation is solved for exactly one of the basic variables as a linear sum of the non-basic variables. Uh, then for each variable, you have upper and lower bounds. And for each variable, you have a current value that is the, is the current, current assignment, candidate assignment. And then the initial configuration uh, is just you take a set of uh, linear arithmetic constraints uh, which is a weighted sum with some uh, equality or inequality compared to a constant. Um, then what you do is you add the linear sum, uh, you, you create a variable representing the, the linear sum on the left-hand side of that uh, constraint. You add that new variable B to the basic variables. You add the equation that B equals the linear, the, the, the sum to the tableau. And then you add D as a bound, either upper or lower or both, depending on what the operator is, if it's uh, inequality or equality. Okay, and then the initial assignment, typically you just start with uh, every variable assigned to zero. Okay, and then there's a set of uh, rules that I'm gonna go through here. And um, the idea is that you want to try to uh, get the variables, the, the assignment to each variable within its bounds. Uh, so first of all, we have these pivot rules. And the idea of the pivot rule is you're only going to be allowed to make changes to the non-basic variables. So if you have a basic variable xi that is, say, below its lower bound, so it's out of bounds, um, then you're going to need to move it to be a non-basic variable. So the pivot operation just chooses a variable to switch it with. Uh, you're, gonna, uh, you're going to solve the equation involving xi for a different variable and substitute that throughout the tableau. Uh, there's this slack operator and slack just means uh, you have to choose a variable that has some ability to change in the direction needed uh, to move xi uh, above its bound. So um, <clears throat> I won't go into the details there. So there's a similar pivot operation if a variable is above its upper bound. Uh, you can pivot it into out of the basic set um, with a similar uh, definition of slack. And then we have this update operator. And so what the update operator says is if you have a variable that's not basic, um, then and you can move it, you have to keep it within its bounds when you move it, uh, but you can change it by some amount delta. So this update operation is just gonna add delta to xj and then update all the variables that depend on xj, uh, all of the basic variables. Okay, and you'll see an example in a minute. Okay, and then success is when every variable is within its bounds. Uh, so the assignment of each xi is between the lower and upper bound. And uh, you can detect failure if for a particular basic variable, uh, it's not within its bounds and there's no slack within the variables it depends on. Uh, so that then you get to a case where it's not possible to satisfy that particular constraint. Good, and one important point to note. Um, so this, this is a, an abstract representation of the standard simplex algorithm and uh, standard results tell us that this is actually uh, sound, complete, and terminating uh, as long as you use an appropriate um, uh, heuristic for how to choose the variables, and there are various ways to do that. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to extend this calculus <clears throat> into what we call the ReliPlex calculus, and the idea is we're going to add one more element to the configuration here. <clears throat> 
Uh, so we have the first five elements as before, but now we're going to have this uh, ReLU connection set R, which is a predicate on the variables. So the initial configuration again as before, but if we have another um, constraint here, xi is the ReLU of xj, then we add this pair xi xj to uh, the set of ReLU connections. And we're going to need to add some rules here to deal with this as well. Uh, okay, so the rule, the main trick that we have here is if we have a variable, again, a non-basic variable, that's part of a ReLU pair, xi, xj, uh, and the xi, xj assignments don't currently satisfy the ReLU uh, function, then what we can do is we can move uh, either the input to the ReLU, in this case, that's the update B um, rule, or the output of the ReLU, which is the update F rule, uh, in order to satisfy the ReLU constraint. Okay, so we're going to allow this additional uh, set of moves in the calculus. Um, we also need one more pivot rule because it could be the case that you have a broken ReLU constraint where both XI uh, but both of the variables involved in the ReLU constraint are basic, so you may need to pivot one of them out in order to change the, let it be a non-basic variable so you can change it. Um, and we're also going to add this ReLU split rule, which says if you do have a ReLU constraint, then you're allowed to consider two cases where uh, either the, either it's in the inactive phase, meaning the upper bound is zero, so the input has to be negative, or it's in the active phase so the input has to be positive and lower bound would be zero. Uh, and this is essentially equivalent to treating this uh, to, to the if then else encoding, um, but it's uh, doing this uh, case split on the if then else equivalent case split inside the calculus. Okay, and finally, success is when um, all of the variables are within their bounds and all of the ReLU constraints are satisfied. So. We add these first four rules and then we replace the old success rule with this ReLU success rule. Okay, good. So let's look at an example to see how this all works. Uh, so suppose again, we have this uh, extremely simple network for the sake of argument. And uh, we wanna ask this question, is it possible for the input to be within zero one and the output to be within the range one half to one? Uh, is that satisfiable? Okay, so the first step is we're going to encode this. Okay, so we write a set of equations that represent the linear constraints. Um, and, and note we've split the hidden uh, nodes into two variables. So we have a variable for the input to the ReLU and a variable for the output from the, from the ReLU. And the inputs are gonna be labeled with W for the weighted sum. Output is A for activation. Um, and, and this uh, makes our encoding easier. Okay, so for the weighted sum constraints, we just have a set of equations here on the left. And uh, remember, we introduce a new variable for each of the uh, linear terms. So we've introduced x5, x6, and x7. Um, and that represents uh, all of the linear constraints. Then we add these two uh, ReLU constraints to R. Uh, so we have two pairs there. Um, and then for the bounds, uh, we have bounds on x1, uh, lower bound is zero. We can also put lower bounds on the output of the values because uh, we know that they will, will never be less than zero. And then for the output x4, we were given a bound of 0.5 lower bound. And then x1 and x4 both have upper bounds of one. Uh, again, the assignment is starting zero, at zero for each variable. And uh, then the basic set, recall, is going to be just these introduced variables, x5, x6, and x7. And for the introduced variables, uh, those are all equal to zero. Um, and so we just set their lower and upper bounds to zero. Good, so this is the encoding. And then uh, let's step through uh, how the algorithm works. So here I, I'm showing the tableau T in the upper left. And then in this table here, I have each variable shown with its current assignment and its current lower and upper bounds. Okay, so the first thing is we notice that x4 is out of bounds, right? So the current assignment is zero. It needs to be between a half and one. 
So we're going to use this update rule, the standard update rule to add 0 0.5 to X4. So we do that. And then if you look at the tableau, we'll see that that affects X7. So X7 also gets updated. And now X7 is out of bounds. OK, so we need to update X7. So how do we do that? Um, X7 is a basic variable, so we need to first pivot it. So we're going to pivot X7. Let's say we pick X2A to be the new basic variable. So we solve for X2A. And now we can go ahead and update X7. So uh, X7 needs to be moved back to 0. So we take care of that. And then this updates X2A. Great. Now, here's where uh, the algorithm departs from the standard simplex algorithm, because uh, you can see that x2a is now mismatched with its ReLU pair x2w. And so we're going to actually use this update b uh, rule to update x2w. So we add 0 0.5 to that variable, um, and that brings it in line. So the ReLU constraint is satisfied. And then, of course, we have to update x5 uh, because it depends on x2w in our tableau t. So we update x5. Now x5 is out of bounds. And uh, you, can probably, you can probably go through this a bit more quickly. You see what's going to happen. We're going to pivot x5. Uh, here, now that we've solved for x1, we also have to update this other equation in the tableau that depends on x1. So we do that. And now we can update x5. So x5 can get moved back to 0. Uh, this also affects x1 and x6. Um, and we're almost there. x1 is OK, but x6 is out of bounds. So we're going to pivot x6. Uh, now we can update x6. That affects x3w. But now notice that x3w is negative and x3a is 0, and that's OK, because the ReLU takes the max with 0, and so that ReLU constraint is still satisfied, and we're done. Uh, we've reached a satisfying assignment. OK, so that gives you a feeling for how this new calculus works. And uh, let's look quickly at the properties of the calculus. So uh, soundness is straightforward. Um, each of the rules uh, you know, is sound. It's not hard to show. Uh, termination is a bit more interesting, though, because you might add, so in the example I showed you, we actually found a solution just doing these pivot and update operations. And so you might ask the question, is it always possible to do that? And uh, that's actually a hard question to answer. So, um, but because the problem is NP complete, we would not expect that there's a solution with pivots and updates. And in fact, in practice, what we see is that we uh, will get into these loops sometimes. So the, a loop happens when you run some simplex steps, then you fix a ReLU, you run some more simplex steps, you fix another ReLU, and then you end up fixing the same ReLU more than once. OK, so it's pretty hard to figure out uh, a way to not get into a loop, but there's an easy way out. So what we can do is we can use this ReLU split rule. Um, to break the loops. And the idea is we'll do this lazily. We'll count the applications of these update F and update B rules. And if the count exceeds some threshold on a particular pair of ReLU constraints, then we will go ahead and split on that ReLU. And now termination and completeness follow easily from properties of the simplex algorithm, because in the worst case, uh, you would split on all of the ReLUs, and then you just have a linear problem. Uh, OK, but of course, we hope that doesn't happen. And in fact, when we tried this on the ACAS XU networks, uh, we were very happy to see that we only had to split about 10% of the time uh, on these ReLU nodes. And so this, this sped things up dramatically, and these problems became tractable. Uh, OK, so that was the first thing I wanted to talk about. And again, the sort of big idea I wanted to illustrate, besides the fact that I think this is uh, exciting, interesting work, is that we, we took a problem where the encoding in, in the SMT solver didn't work the first time. We were able to actually use the flexibility of the solver to expand the theory 
uh, expand the solver and solve the problem. And th this is now a, an exciting research area, this verification of neural networks. You can find out more about it. Uh, we had uh, this particular work is from our CAV paper in 2017. Um, we have a tool that implements this calculus called Marabou, uh, which you can uh, read about and look at on GitHub. And uh, coming up this month, there will be two workshops at CAV uh, dedicated to uh, these kinds of areas of formal methods with uh, ML systems. All right, good. So let's talk about uh, the other application, which is strings. And this is also joint work with a, a host of great people. Um, I want to especially highlight uh, Andy Reynolds and Andres Nertsley, who have done a ton of recent work in this area. OK, so as a motivation for this application, uh, let me bring up symbolic execution. So symbolic execution is um, a technique where essentially you take a program, uh, you enumerate some set of program paths that could end in some bad state, and then you represent uh, the program inputs as SMT variables, translate the statements along the paths uh, into constraints, and then you want to solve the constraints to show whether it's possible to take any of these bad paths. Uh, okay, so this is uh, pretty well understood and it's used in lots of places. Uh, as one particular example, you might use this to find security vulnerabilities. And the idea here is you would take your code and a particular security policy, uh, translate them into SMT using the symbolic execution engine and then the solver either returns a solution that shows you a way to, uh, to create an exploit for this security vulnerability, or it proves that no exploit can exist. Um, OK, and when we first started looking at this, uh, we were, you know, we noted that um, a lot of times in many applications, you have code that's manipulating strings. And the sort of standard technique at the time uh, which is based on a bit vector encoding into SMT has a number of problems. So first of all, in order to reason about strings using bit vectors, you essentially have to break them up into bytes uh, and reason about the bytes individually, which means that if you have operations that are looping over the length of the string, uh, you better fix the maximum length of the string so in order to make your problem bounded. And then those operations have to turn into unrolled loops. So this is just uh, not very efficient and uh, created a lot of bottlenecks for symbolic execution. OK, so what can we do? Um, so again, here I'm going to highlight the uh, flexibility of being able to uh, modify or, in this case, add new theory solvers. And so we defined a theory of strings and a calculus for reasoning this theory. Uh, OK, so what does the theory of strings look like? Well, um, we're going to have some finite fixed set of characters, the alphabet A. And then we have a few basic operators. So there's an empty string. <laughs> there's a, a constant C for each character in the alphabet. Um, and then we can take the length of a string, we can concatenate two strings, we can ask whether strings are equal, and we can also ask whether a string is a member of simple uh, regular expression. Okay, so with this uh, language, the, we already run into some challenges. Um, so first of all, even with just concatenation and equality, this is a well-known uh, problem, the word equations problem. Uh, it is decidable, but the complexity is high. Um, if you add length, which we did here, uh, this the decidability of that is, is still open. So we're already in uh, a, a language whose decidability is unknown. And then if you add, say, just a simple replace operator, um, it becomes undecidable. OK, so you know what we're going to do is take a pragmatic approach. So we're going to use a rule-based calculus um, that we think will work well in practice. Uh, we're going to leverage the existing arithmetic solver to reason about length constraints. And essentially, we're going to embrace this incompleteness problem. Uh, it's OK if, if we don't have 
a complete algorithm because uh, we're going to, you know, uh, focus on the problems that we see. And often in practice, you don't run into uh, the kinds of problems that, that give you worst case behavior. So what kinds of things can we do? So here's a simple example. Um, and here we're saying X and Y are strings that have the same length. X is not the empty string, Z is not the empty string. And then you have this uh, concatenation constraint that says if we take X, concatenate it with a particular character, C1, and then concatenate that with Y, that's the same as taking Y with a different character, C2 and Z. So what kind of deductions can we do on the, these sets of constraints? Uh, all right, so we have a rule that says that if two strings are equal, they have the same length. So we can apply that. Um, then uh, we have this rule that says, well, every string is either the empty string or it's not the empty string. So we can uh, look at these cases. <clears throat> All right, in the first case, if y is the empty string, that implies that its length is zero. But we know that x is not the empty string, and that implies that its length is greater than zero. And since x and y have to have the same length, that gives us a conflict in this case. So let's consider the other case where y is not the empty string. Um, so now we can apply this rule that looks uh, at the last constraint where you have a concatenation of two strings that are equal to each other. And if you know that uh, the prefix of these two strings, which are X and Y respectively, um, if we know that those are not empty, which we do, and we know they have the same length, which we also do, then we can conclude that those two strings are equal. So this F unify rule lets us conclude that X equals Y. Uh, now we can apply what we call the normalized rule, which allows us to um, replace this last constraint, we replace the y on the right hand side with x because x equals y. Uh, and now we can uh, also pull off the x from both sides. And this allows us to conclude that c1 equals c2. And because c1 and c2 are different constants, uh, this gives us a conflict. And we can deduce that this entire set of constraints is unsatisfied. All right, so that's just an example. Uh, that hopefully gives you a feeling for the kind of reasoning that we're going to do in this string solver. So we uh, implemented this in our solver, CVC4, and our users uh, were happy, but of course they're never quite happy enough. And so the first thing, uh, first kind of feedback we got was, all right, this is great, but um, that's a very restricted set of operators. And in practice, in the real world, uh, we have all sorts of additional operators that we do on strings. Uh, can you help us? All right, so again, we're going to look at our flexible solver and say, yes, we can do this. So first we're going to extend the theory. And so it's not hard to just extend theory of strings by adding the, uh, some new operators corresponding to the operators used in programming languages. Um, and in fact, there's a nice easy way to implement them because we can reduce these new operators to the core theory. Uh, so let's take a look at some examples of what these new operators might be. So you might have something like a substring operator that takes uh, for a given string x, we're going to find a substring of x starting at some position with some length. Um, the contains operator is true if um, string x contains another string y as a substring. Index of tells us the position of the first occurrence of a string y and another string x starting at some position. And then we have this uh, replace operator that allows us to replace the first occurrence of x by some uh, other string y. Notice we're replacing just the first occurrence and that uh, avoids the undecidability, although Again, we, we don't worry too much about undecidability if we can find things that work well in practice. Uh, okay, so good. How do we solve these? Well, uh, I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but um, for example, the substring operation can be broken down into an if then else construct with a bunch of constraints about concatenation and length and so on. Uh, and so, in fact, that can be represented entirely in the core theory. Um, then the contains 
operation can be represented uh, as a quantifier with the substring operation. Index of, you can see, uh, can be represented using contains and substring. And finally, replace uh, using contains and index of. So anyway, you apply all of these transformations and you can boil everything back down into the core theory. So great. So we've satisfied our users. We added these uh, high-level operators, uh, except, of course, they're not satisfied because uh, the reduction to the core theory ends up uh, blowing up in many cases. All right, so can we do more? And the answer is yes. So uh, the idea here is sort of analogous to what we did in the neural network example. Uh, instead of reasoning about these operators essentially outside the solver, what is what we've done so far by doing this encoding, can we push them down further inside the solver so that we're reasoning directly about the new operators. Um, now, this is quite challenging for these operators. Uh, coming up with a calculus that would somehow uh, reason about them is not so easy. But there is a clever idea uh, of something we can do. And this is the idea. What we're going to do is we're not going to reduce these high-level uh, constraints to the core theory. Instead, we're just going to keep them around. Um, but we're also not going to try to, to manipulate them directly. Instead, we're periodically going to try to simplify them based on you know, what we know about their arguments. And this works well because as you explore the space of string constraints um, in the core theory, you make additional assumptions about strings. You may know their length. You may know uh, a lot in some branch of the proof tree that they're equal to some uh, constant string literal. And then this can actually be used to make to simplify the high level constraints. So what are some examples of these uh, simplifications that I'm talking about? So let's just look at some examples with the contains operator. Uh, so if L1 and L2 are string constants, then you can tell whether L1 contains L2, right? So either it does or it doesn't, you can reduce this to false. Um, similarly, if you have uh, L1 contains some L2 concatenated with some other stuff. If L1 already doesn't contain L2, we can reduce that to false. Uh, if, uh, let's see, this one is similar. It says if you remove L2 from L1, so let's say L1 does contain L2, but if you remove it, and then you're able to show that the result uh, does not contain T, then you can reduce this constraint to false. Um, and I think I, I won't go through the rest of these. You get the idea. Uh, basically, you have a set of, of powerful rewrite tools that you can periodically revisit uh, in order to um, reduce these high-level constraints uh, to something simpler. And this actually works pretty well. OK. And the SMT user comes back and says, that's great. But now I have some really hard problems, again, from symbolic execution, where you know, your simplifier is just not quite good enough, and it still times out. So we can do what I'm going to call supercharging the simplifier. So basically, uh, the simplifications I just showed you are, are basic, but we can do something more powerful by doing conditional rewriting. And to do this, we actually build a mini inference engine inside the simplifier. Uh, in order to derive the conditions that we need to apply the simplifications. So let me show you, uh, again, by example, sort of how this might work. Uh, OK, so, so imagine now that we have uh, a separate sort of mini inference engine inside the string solver that's just going to try to deduce everything it possibly can about the lengths of strings. What could you do with that? Well. Now, if you know something about the lengths of T and S being different, uh, you can conclude that those strings are not equal. Uh, if you know that um, the lengths of S and Q are at least as large as the length of T, then if T is this concatenation of S, R, and Q, then you know that R has to be the empty string. Okay. Uh, similarly, if um, if S is the size of S is larger than or equal to the size of T, uh, 
and you were, want to reason about whether t contains s, then the only way that t can contain s in this case is if they're equal. So you can rewrite this uh, to t equals s and so on, right? So there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, things you can do once you know more about the lengths. And so what we did is we actually built these inference engines about string length, about um, which strings are contained in other strings and so on. And then we can use these additional uh, inferred facts to do even stronger uh, simplification of these high level operators. Um, and this actually works really well. Okay, so uh, after all of this work, uh, we ba basically have optimized the hell out of these symbolic execution benchmarks and uh, we can declare victory. Uh, but of course, you know, there's this nagging doubt which is what if we basically have now overfit to this symbolic execution domain? Uh, have we really come up with a general solution or have we just overfit to the benchmark? So this is something that I worried about. Um, but then we got this really nice piece of news. So the Amazon automated reasoning group uh, at Flock a couple of years ago basically came up to us and said, hey, we really like your string solver. Uh, and by the way, we're calling it a few million times a day uh, to secure access control policies in the cloud. Um, so you can imagine what our uh, reaction to this was. It was something like this, right? <laughs> okay, so their tool is this tool called Zelkova. And uh, essentially what happens is you can write uh, these access control policies for buckets in the cloud. And these access control policies use um, some string manipulation. And uh, they found our solver uh, and also Z3. And, and they built this tool on top of CVC4 and Z3 uh, that encodes this access policy uh, as a string constraint. And it can tell you whether one policy is stronger than another. And this is really useful because you can do things like determine that a new policy that someone has written is no stronger than the policy that gives access to everyone. And then you can warn that user and say, hey, you just wrote a policy that's equivalent to the public policy. You probably didn't mean to do that. Uh, and the customers find this really valuable. Uh, OK, so this also started a, a great um, interaction with uh, you know, Byron and Neha and the folks at Amazon that we're quite excited about. Um, but of course, the story doesn't quite end there, right? Uh, they said, hey, there's just this one small thing. Um, you know, your solver is great and we can reason about all these operations, but uh, it turns out that these security policies use a lot of regular expressions. Uh, anyway, you can speed those up a bit. All right, well, so now I'm gonna give you a sneak peek of some work that's not published yet of what we're doing to try to uh, speed up these regular expressions. So here's an example. Um, just to give you the flavor. So you might have something like uh, a string X has to be in a language that starts with uh, zero or more digits, then has an A, then it has some arbitrary string, then it has a B and some other arbitrary string. Uh, and then you might also know that X is not in the language that starts with zero or more digits, uh, then has an A and then has some arbitrary string. Okay, so for if you stare at this for just a second, you realize that um, this first language is actually more restrictive than the second language. So if it's not in the second language, it can't possibly be in the first language. Great, so that seems pretty straightforward, but actually getting the uh, solver to figure this out is a bit of a challenge. So sort of obvious thing to do here, if you have constraints like X is in L1, but not in L2, um, you can do this this thing where you say, all right, let's just uh, take the complement of the language R2, intersect it with the language R1, and uh, derive this new constraint. And this will be you know, a great way to move forward. Uh, so this is elegant, but the problem is that reasoning about complement and intersection of regular languages is quite expensive. Uh, so we did, this is, again was sort of uh, the first thing to try, but it's, it's not going to work well to give a, something that works well in practice. So uh, the current approach we have is what we call this word-based approach, uh, where we're going to try to represent these constraints as um, 
uh, constraints using uh, the core language of the string theory. So you can translate this first constraint by saying that x is some string that starts with x1, then it has an a, then it has an x2, and then a b, and then an x3. And then we additionally know that x1 has to be in this uh, regular language of just a di zero or more digits. Okay, so that gives us this first constraint. And then, um, right, and then for for the second constraint, in order to model that something is not in the language, we would say that, again, x has these uh, parts. There's x4, x5, and x6. Uh, and whenever uh, x is equal to the concatenation of these three, then either x4 is not a string of digits or x5 is not the string a. And we have to use a quantifier to represent that. Uh, OK, so this actually works pretty well in practice because we have good uh, quantifier heuristics, but we still have this zero to nine uh, Kleene star. And the way we handle that is by essentially um, unfolding it uh, in sort of a breadth first way. So for this particular example, this leads to a non-terminating sequence of unfoldings. And let, let me show you how that works. So essentially you, you would, we would do a case split on X1 um, so we know that x1 is in this uh, 0 to 9 star. So that means either x1 is the empty string, or x1 is a single character in 0 to 9, or it consists of two or more characters. And the way we unfold that is we say that x1 is a concatenation of three things, where the first and last thing are a digit, and the thing in the middle is, again, this uh, 0 to 9 star. Now, what's nice about this unfolding is by putting a digit up at the beginning and end of the sequence, you can often trigger more simplifications. But in the worst case, you, you have to unfold this middle part. And for this particular example, this middle part just gets unfolded forever. What you really need here is you need to figure out that you have to instantiate x4 with uh, this prefix x1, a, and x2 and then instantiate x, x5 and x6 in the appropriate way. So you could do that, but uh, coming up with heuristics to figure that out is quite challenging. So here's a, here's a different approach. So we're gonna keep our word encoding here because it works well in, on many examples. We're gonna supplement it with some additional incomplete procedures. And in particular, uh, we can layer on a procedure for detecting uh, language inclusion. So let's say we're able in some cases to determine whether one language is included in another. Uh, then if you have this particular pattern where X is in R1, X is not in R2, and R1 is the sublanguage of R2, then you conclude, can conclude uh, inconsistency. So here's a set of rules that you could use for this, right? So I'll give you a sample. An empty string is always contained in anything. Um, uh, a language of a, uh, any language is contained in the uh, sigma star language. Uh, if you have a language, all of whose elements are strings of length one, that's contained in the language of all single string characters and so on. All right? Yet we have transitivity. Uh, we have um, some range constraints. And then there's this one on the bottom left that says, if R1 is contained in R2, then you can add a prefix to each of them and maintain the containment, and so on. And then for our particular example, uh, this ends up being quite straightforward. Uh, we can first just show that the language consisting by any string followed by B followed by any string is contained in, in uh, the language of uh, all strings. And then we can add a prefix to both sides. And that shows that, uh, in fact, the first language is contained in the second language. And that allows us to conclude that this is inconsistent. Uh, so these are the types of things that we're working on right now in our collaboration with Amazon to uh, be able to expand the set of constraints that we can easily reason about uh, with regular expressions. And you can find out more about this work. There are a number of papers about string solving uh, from us and others. Some of ours are listed here. Um, Amazon had a nice paper about their tool in FMCAD a couple years ago. And of course, 
uh, you can look at our solver uh, implemented in CBC4. Okay, so let me just draw some conclusions. Um, basically, the first point I'd like to highlight is, you know, for those of us working in automated reasoning, when we uh, enter these collaborations with industry or other users of our tools, this is a great way to discover uh, new domains for uh, automated reasoning and new research challenges. And uh, really the, the main point I wanted to make in this talk is that uh, if we take this view that uh, automated reasoning solvers are adaptable and flexible, then this is a great way to sort of break through these bottlenecks in uh, workflows uh, that, our, that our users uh, have. And uh, I think this is a general principle and, and is something that, that we can think about as a community. But in particular, the SMT paradigm seems to be at a bit of a sweet spot in that uh, it is very flexible, but when we uh, enhance these solvers in a flexible way, we still end up with uh, quite general solutions. So this is really nice. Um, and then I think one of the biggest challenges that we face uh, in SMT and in general is it still requires an expert to modify these uh, solvers, right? So a big challenge is how can we make it easier for non-experts to adapt and customize uh, our tools? And I, I think that's a, a challenge that, that can keep us busy for many years. Um, and then just maybe to highlight one uh, potential uh, uh, new application, I'd just like to mention that we're working on a new collaboration with uh, the Facebook Novi team. This is the team uh, that's working with the uh, new Libra cryptocurrency and the Libra blockchain. And we're building, uh, uh, in, in collaboration with them, we're building a prover for the Move language, which is a smart contract language for their blockchain. And uh, this is a great a new domain because they're using all kinds of interesting things that we don't see in some other benchmarks. So heavy use of finite arrays, um, some sophisticated nested data types, lots of quantifiers and really big bit vectors. And so we think that there's plenty of exciting research ahead in this and other applications. Uh, okay, and with that, I'll conclude and um, be happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks, Clark, for this great talk. Um, I think we have um, one question from Roberto. And Roberto, I just gave you. Uh, yes, OK. Uh, hi, Clark. Um, uh, just a matter of curiosity. Um, well, many years ago, you, Cesare, Robert, and Albert uh, proposed splitting on demand. Uh -huh. And there, the idea was to move the complexity of a case splitting outside the theory solver, right? Yes. So the intuition was, well, see, the, th the sub solver is very good to reason on Boolean choices, and so why do that? It, right. Regarding the Reluplex uh, work, it seems that here you have gone in the ex opposite direction, mm. right? So it seems that you have taken something which is in a naive encoding uh, uh, shared between uh, uh, Boolean reasoning and, uh, and theory reasoning, and theory reasoning was uh, polynomial. And then yeah. you move the, the hardness of a case splits inside, uh, inside the theory, okay? Which seems the opposite direction that you did uh, mm -hmm. years ago. Can you have an intuitive, intuitive justification why it works in terms of uh, why is this right. Result? Right. Okay. So good. Great question. Um, so I think I would look at it just a little bit differently. Uh, so what we did is we took something where this, the splitting was entirely done outside the solver, right? And now what we're going to do is we're going to be very careful about when we split and the knowledge about, about that is inside of the solver. However, when we do split, we still use the splitting on demand uh, okay, uh, notion, right? So, so basically what we're trying to do, you know, we're trying to leverage everything we can here. And, and in this case, the SAT solver doesn't know when to split on these ReLU constraints very well, uh, but the theory solver does. And so what we've done is we've empowered the theory solver to sort of take charge of when to split on those things. But when it does split, yeah, then we would just relegate that back with the splitting on demand. Okay. Okay, so it's more and then 
uh, splitting lazily rather than splitting eagerly. So That's say. right. Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. So you, you can ask questions directly in the chat or raising your hands uh, or using the Q, uh, Q and A um, uh, window. Uh, meanwhile, I have a question too. Um, so this uh, trick that you used for a special uh, application, um, didn't you think about extending it and making it available, um, well, kind of naturally in, in the SMT um, uh, at the SMT level, so, so that um, the benchmarks that you had before would also benefit from from this special uh, trick or or an extension. Which, which trick are you talking about? I, I'm I'm talking about the uh, Re Relu trick, so the, mm. the the one that allows you to tweak uh, simplex a bit, so that some right. you put some IT inside. Yes, uh, I, I think. You know, I have, I guess we have, um, you know, big plans for for trying to in integrate this. So, so currently, this Reluplex uh, algorithm is implemented in this custom tool, Marabou. Uh, it's not integrated in CVC4, but you know, we think that's a, a great direction that could also improve um, the arithmetic solver in CVC4. And I think it does open up a really interesting space then of, you know, and this sort of goes back to Roberto's question as well. When you have some disjunctions in your formula, uh, does it make sense to push some of those inside the solver and let the solver decide uh, to fix those eagerly or, or to fix those lazily or, or do splitting? Um, so yeah, I think ultimately we would love to make more of this functionality available uh, the user can can do instead of having it magically inside the solver. But we haven't done it yet. Okay, thanks. Um, Andre, you, Andre Langell, you, you have, you are allowed to talk, so you can ask your question directly. Okay, I want to, to ask about a question about the language inclusion check. So you said yeah. you don't do the complement and intersection of automata. Uh, there are more more efficient tests now based on, for example, anti-chains or mm, by simulations up to congruence where you don't need to do the construction and they are quite efficient in practice. Have you tried them or? Um, I don't think we have. So that's great. I, I would love to get a pointer to some of that work and we could take a look. Yeah, yeah that would be really interesting. In the auto efficient algorithms for automata. So you might really be interested in this. Cool, great. Okay, thanks. Okay. So we are um, running out of time now, and I think there are no more questions, but I'm sure Clark would be happy to answer questions by mail. Uh, so contact him if you have more Definitely. questions. And uh, so on behalf of the uh, attendees, uh, thank you very much for this great talk. Thanks.